because we are kings and our words matter. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises Hosanna Hosanna Come out the way of among us We welcome you here, Lord Jesus Hear the sound of hearts we Turning to you, we turn to you. In your kingdom, broken lives are made new. We make us new. When we see you, we find strength. Face the day. Cause in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come on your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, oh, welcome to this place, Hosanna, 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 you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our Hosanna, Hosanna, come on your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away sing it again when we see you because when we see you we find strength to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Worthy of all our praises Hosanna, Hosanna Come have your way among us We welcome you here, Lord Jesus We 
place in this place. Come have your way among us. Take your throne among us. This next song talks about how these are wonderful days. How many of you believe that? People out in the world will tell you, oh, these are not so wonderful days. We don't know what's going to happen to the economy, what's going to happen to the dollar and the rupee, and what's going to happen with this and that. No, no, I say these are wonderful days. <laughs> these are days of Elijah, we can say. These are days of Moses, these are days of Ezekiel. In fact, I would say these are better days. Sometimes you read the Bible and you think, you know, oh, I wish I was there during the time of Moses. I wish I was there when Moses parted the Red Sea. You know, I wish I was there when David killed Goliath. My friend, actually, the New Testament days are supposed to be better than that. These are better days. If you really believe it, sing it with us. And let's continue to celebrate our God. Let's clap our hands. of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord these are the days of your servant Moses righteousness being restored and though these are days of great trials of famine and darkness and sore so we are the voice in the desert Crying, prepare me the way of the Lord. We are holding up, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, hear a jubilee. Now the giants in salvation. The dry bones becoming his flesh And these are the days of his servant David Rebuilding the temple of praise These are the days of the harvest The fields are as wide as the world We are the laborers in your Declaring the word of the Lord We hold it up Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun At the trumpet calls Let us know the one To give us to live Out of science Till salvation comes We hold it up Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun Trumpet call to lift your voice To hear a jubilee Out of science till salvation comes We're to sing, there's no God like our God Here we go There's no God like Jehovah There's no God like Jehovah There's no God like Jehovah there's no God like Jehovah. 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 There's no God like Jehovah.
since we are getting closer and closer to the return of Jesus, these must be better days. Amen. Right? Amen. Let's continue to worship Jesus, our Lord.
And as we worship build your throne And as we worship build your throne And as we worship build your throne Come Lord Jesus and take praise him continue to worship him with lifted hands with raised voices let your praise go up from this place <coughs> oh Lord we praise you we worship you oh Lord nothing compares to you nothing compares uh, to who you are nothing compares to what you have done for us nothing compares to the great plan and purpose that you have for us nothing compares Oh Lord, there is no one like you. Nothing compares to the precious promises, the great and many and precious promises that you've given us, your people. And so we stand here in awe of you, oh Lord. We consider it a privilege and an honor to worship you. And we thank you for honoring us with your presence in this place. 
we thank you that you are here lord jesus we thank you that your spirit is here in this place we thank you that people are going to be set free today because you are here we thank you that people are going to be changed transformed encouraged uplifted because the presence of the lord is here we believe it oh lord we look forward to the word of god being preached with power authority with clarity may we not just hear the words of a man but the word of god himself may you speak to us through your anointed servant we come at the rest of this service into your mighty hands may it be used for your glory and the extension of your kingdom we pray these things in jesus precious name amen you may be seated let's continue to worship god by giving our tithes and offerings please get your tithe and offering ready amen yeah and if you're watching online you can click on that online giving link and uh, give with us if you wish to do so let's all say this before we give jesus said give and it shall be given back to you good measure pressed down shaken together and running over shall men pour into your bosom i believe what jesus said lord you are my source i look up to you i depend on you and so i give to you amen as you give we want to welcome newcomers in this place if you are here for the first time in our church can you please raise your hand thank you thank you kindly keep your hand raised for just a few seconds until you receive a brochure from our ushers once you receive the brochure you may put your hand down if you haven't received the brochure kindly please keep your hand raised even if you're seated outside upstairs just wait for that brochure before you put your hand down <coughs> that brochure that you just received has our church service timings contact details information about our tv programs you'll also see a little welcome note from pastor sam inside that brochure you will also find a white card we want you to fill that out with your name and other details after the end of this service please take that white card outside to the newcomers desk when you hand it over to them they will give you a free cd that has 10 messages of pastor sam plus they will give you a free copy of our tamil magazine vetrium varvum on behalf of pastor sam and the entire aft family i take this opportunity to welcome you and we hope that you will continue to come and experience for yourself the life changing power of the word of god that is working in this place bands of marriage publish the bands of marriage between miss daphne christina daughter of mr and mrs divya kumar members of our church and mr varun andrew david son of mr and mrs vijay and david members of csi st luke's church mandavali chennai when if you know any just cause why these two should not be joined together in holy matrimony you may declare it this is the first bands of marriage i publish the bands of marriage between mr jones roland son of mr and mrs xavier jayachandran members of our church and miss veena daughter and mr and mrs chellam devdas members of csa parent bar parent baralayam arumbakam chennai if any be any no any just cause why these two should not be joined together in matrimony you may declare it this is the first bands of marriage well we've got the calendar that uh, that was sold out last week we printed some more and is available in the back in our bookstore it's only 20 rupees those of you who want it you can get it the five confessions are there in that calendar the five confessions that we've been teaching are there please turn with me to the book of hebrews chapter 4 the book of hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14 Hebrews 4:14 Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold fast our confession let us hold fast our confession 
we've been teaching on the law of faith and uh, in this teaching on the law of faith we are now right now currently teaching about our confession and uh, the English Bible puts it very beautifully. It says, let us hold fast our confession. So we identified what our confession is. I showed you how that our confession is not a confession of sin. It is a confession of what we believe concerning Jesus Christ and what he is to us. And it is that confession we need to hold fast to. Not the confession of sin. Confession of sin is made only when we sin. But the thing that we hold fast to is the confession of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and everything. And we've been showing how that confession is very important to faith. In order for faith to work, confession is very important. I gave you already four things about why confession is important. We've been looking at the logic behind confession, showed you why confession is important the first is faith filled words dominate the law of sin and death there is a law of sin and death there is an operation when you speak faith filled words this sets the, the other law in motion the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus not the law of death but the law of life is set in motion by speaking negatively, you set the law of sin and death in motion. So that everything bad begins to happen. By speaking positively, you begin to set the law of the life, in, uh, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus in motion. Secondly, we showed you that positive confession is the way that we exercise authority in the world of the spirit. In the spirit realm, in the spirit world, Positive confession matters very much because that's the way we exercise our authority. Jesus said, I mean a man came to Jesus and you said, you speak a word and my servant will be healed. Servant who is far away will be healed if you spoke one word here. He says, in the spirit world, word carries great authority and power. That is why we are told that we can bind on earth and it will be bound. We can loose on earth and it will be, be loosed. Because there is authority in the spirit realm. That's how you exercise authority. Thirdly, confession, positive confession activates the angels of God to come to our aid so that the promises of God can be fulfilled. We showed you how the angels are ministering spirits. They are there to minister to us. And when they minister to us, is when we take the word of God and give voice to the word of God because the angels do what God's word says but they do it hearing the voice of the word we showed you fourthly we showed you con confession brings possession and we began to talk about it <coughs> we began to talk about it uh, last week how that confession brings possession and said a few things about why that is so, why it is confession that brings possession. And today we're going to look at some more concerning that. Why that God has ordained it so that confession brings possession. Last week I showed you confession, is, confession brings possession is an old law by which God himself operates. He says and whatever he says was so. Whatever he said was so. Whatever he said came into being. That is what confession brings possession means. God speaks and whatever he spoke comes into being or came into being. Uh, but today let's go a little deeper into this and see why this confession brings possession is so true. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel chapter 1. Matthew's Gospel chapter 1. And let me read to you from verse 18. Matthew's Gospel chapter 1, verse 18 onwards. Now the, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his, mother, Mary was, uh, after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, 
she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, take you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you, will, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with the child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Verse 22 is the thing that I want you to notice. All this was done. That is the entire, uh, the, the whole thing that had to do with Mary and Joseph and how she conceived and, and the whole controversy surrounding it. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, a virgin shall be with a child. A prophet has already spoken that a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. That is why Mary bore, I mean, Mary conceived and uh, became pregnant with Jesus, it says. Now, the reason I wanted to point out verse 22 is this. It says, all this was done so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Not only did God in the beginning operate in this way that he spoke and it came into being this is the way he always operates anytime he does something he always speaks and then only he does whatever he speaks it comes to pass there's one difference in the beginning man was not there everything that you see in this world was not there the world was without form void that is empty and it was full of darkness and in that dark vacuum where there was nothing, God spoke and everything that you see today came into being. At that time, man was not there. So God himself spoke. Today, when God wants, to, wants something to happen in this world, God doesn't do like that. He doesn't speak directly, you know, uh, like he spoke back then. What he does is, he takes a man... And through that man speaks what is going to happen. And then only that which was spoken begin to, begins to happen. First a man speaks it and then it happens. The reason is this. Because after God created man, God doesn't speak directly because man is now put in charge of the world. He is the master over this world. Like the psalmist said, what is man? You are mindful of him. What is the son of man that you visit him? You have crowned him with glory and honor. And set him over all your creation. God has set man over all of his creation as an authority over all his creation. So that anything that needs to be done on earth is now done by man speaking. Only by man speaking things happen in this world. God has set this in order. God does not come and speak. Man must speak, then only it must happen. So if something good must happen in your life, in your home, in whatever areas of your life, God doesn't come and stand in your house and say, let there be light. Have you ever heard him speak that? You'll never hear him speak that. He will, he will never come and say, let there be prosperity, let there be peace, you know. You and your wife are fighting and God comes and says, let there be peace. No. God says, you speak it. God says, I don't have to speak it. I'm not going to speak. I spoke when man was not there to speak. I spoke before man was made. I spoke because man was not there. Ever since man was created, God does not speak in that way. God tells man to speak because man is the... Lord over this earth. Man has been placed in authority over everything. Now you understand that whether you work in the government or in private sector, 
there is a hierarchy of authority anywhere you go in any company or any place so that the top person there suppose 2000 people are working there the top person does not go to the person who's at the very bottom and directly give his orders the order filters through the hierarchy of authority right he orders someone next to him someone down the line and that person in turn orders the other person down the line that is how order filters down because that's the way to do it there is a way to do it now with regard to the earth god has set the order of hierarchy in this way even though god is the creator god is overall god has put man as in charge now he says whatever needs to happen in this world it will happen only by man speaking god executes everything in this world through man and that is the purpose for why there were prophets and that's the purpose of their declarations throughout the old testament old testament why did the prophets prophesy in the old testament why did they speak about the birth of jesus the life of jesus the death of jesus the resurrection of jesus all of these things have been prophesied they've been prophesied in just such detail where he would be born how he would be born everything was prophesied what will happen in his death how he'll be resurrected all of these things have been prophesied that's why you see peter standing on the day of pentecost just pulling out psalm 16 and quotes it and says this was spoken about not about david but about jesus and his resurrection authoritatively he interprets it in that way he says this is speaking about jesus psalms are speaking about jesus and his resurrection he says and so many other instances like that even matthew here says these things happen so that that which was pro pro spoken by the prophet may be fulfilled so the prophet spoke then only happened so whenever god wanted to do something he always raised up a man to speak the words related to that so that the things that is spoken may happen first the word then the deed first the word then only it happens first god speaks and then only things happen this is the order this is the way god has set things and this is the way the things happen in the world not only with regard to christ's birth and death and resurrection and all that everything is first spoken and then done that's the way god operates today in this world a man must speak it so you and i are the ones if when, when god wants to do something god raises up one of us to open our mouth and speak and that is how things are done here on earth how much more when god wants to do something in your life in your family in your business in your affairs of your life how much more then that god is looking to speak through you he wants you to take his word and he wants you to speak so that what you speak may come to pass all right turn with me to matthew 11 matthew's gospel chapter 11 and verse 11 matthew's gospel chapter 11 and verse 11 in fact i'll read you from verse 8 so you'll understand a little better Matthew 11, 8. But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he, who of, whom, uh, uh, he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, uh, uh, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So Jesus is saying something about John the Baptist here. A very remarkable statement. He says John the Baptist is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. That's the essence of what he's saying. Who did you go out to see? You went to hear John the Baptist, who is he? He's a prophet. Yes, he's much more than that. He's, in other words, he's, he's wanting to say that, well, there have been a lot of prophets in the Old Testament. And uh, he's the last of the Old Testament prophets. Not only last, he's the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. He's the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Now, when I say John the Baptist is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, you must understand because some people may think, well, 
John the Baptist is in the, is in the New Testament, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark and Luke and so on. How can you say that he's an Old Testament prophet? I am referring to Old Testament time period. If you, I'm referring to the dispensation of the Old Testament. When does the New Covenant dispensation start? When does the New Testament start actually? It begins with the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. The New Covenant comes into effect only with the resurrection of Jesus. Only after the redemptive work is done, new creation is made, new covenant comes into effect. The, new, the covenant was cut on the cross of Calvary when Jesus shed his blood. That is how the new covenant comes into being. So anything that happens before that is Old Covenant, Old Testament, technically. Even though John the Baptist's story comes here, his ministry, his teaching, his preaching, everything belongs to the time period of the Old Testament, actually. Until the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus, everything is Old Testament. So that even the ministry of Jesus, you can say, is under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. That's why the Bible says he was born of a woman, born under the law. Born under the law. So even the ministry of Jesus was under the Old Covenant. Only after Jesus rose again, the New Covenant begins. That is a special nature of, nature of the of the epistles that we have. They're very special because they come after the resurrection of Jesus. The new covenant has been inaugurated, opened up, and then the epistles are written and they are basically an explanation of what this new covenant is all about. That's the new covenant scriptures there. So John the Baptist is the greatest of the Old Testament prophet. Now, he's the greatest, he says. Jesus says he's the greatest, absolutely the greatest. But, he says, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than him, than John the Baptist. That is a remarkable statement. I can understand when Jesus says John the Baptist is the greatest of the Old Testament prophet, but he says the least in the kingdom of God, that is, which kingdom? When did the kingdom begin? When was the kingdom inaugurated? When Jesus came, when he died and rose again and opened up the new covenant, that is when the kingdom got inaugurated. That is when through new birth you can enter into the kingdom. You must be born again. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom, he says. So, we now live in a period where you can enter into the kingdom of God. So, he's talking about this kingdom in which people can enter. In the kingdom of God, that is, in the, under the new covenant, you may say. In other words, under the new covenant, the least among us is greater than the greatest of the Old Testament prophet. Now, we can read that it says so, but how is it so? How is it possible that we, you know, some people will be shocked when you say, you are greater than John the Baptist. You say, my God, man, you know, don't fool me. I am just an ordinary Joe, <laughs> you know. You tell me that I am greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a great man of God. He was the one who prepared the way of the Lord. You know, God chose him. He's a very special person. And you mean to tell me that he was the greatest prophet among the Old Testament prophet? Yet I am greater than him. I'm just an ordinary old Christian today. And I'm greater than the greatest Old Testament prophet. Is that what Jesus is saying? Well, what can I do? That's what he's saying. So we just need to understand why it is so. Why are we, the least among us, greater than the greatest of the Old Testament prophet, which is John the Baptist? Why? The reason is this. The New Testament differs greatly from the Old Testament so that it is called a better covenant. Everybody knows that, right? It's called a better covenant with better promises, it says. In what way is it a better covenant? In what way is it better than the older covenant? The way it is better than the older covenant is this. Under the old covenant, there were only some people that were prophets, not everybody. In the nation of Israel, there was one prophet, maybe a few prophets, one or two here and there, that's all. Those prophets were anointed by God, specially anointed, called by God, and they spoke on behalf of God. God did not speak to everyone. Only certain people were anointed, particularly in the nation of Israel, only three categories of people were anointed, the kings, the priests and the prophets were anointed. Not everybody was anointed. So anybody that wanted to know anything about what God is saying, what God wants done, 
God communicated through these anointed men and women that he had chosen and placed in their position. So when something had to be done, even kings, when they wanted to know what God is saying about a particular situation, you find kings, sometimes under the old covenant, sending people out there to the prophet. Kings send messengers to the prophet to inquire whether they can go to war or not. So they go and ask the prophet, shall we go to war? The king wants to know. And the prophet says, yes, you can go to war or no. And when the king doesn't like the reply, sometimes the king told the people, well, get a prophet who will talk what we want to hear, you know. <laughs> you see that kind of situation in the, under the old covenant. Not everybody can say, God told me to do this. God revealed to me. God spoke to me. Nobody can say, God spoke to me. The word, thus saith the Lord, were authoritatively spoken only by prophets who were called and anointed and chosen by God. These very special people. The rest of the nation depended upon this one man. Or few men that were chosen or women that were chosen. That's the way things worked back then. So you can see the kind of respect that the prophet had. A special place that the prophet held in the nation of Israel. He was a special man called and anointed. God spoke to him, not to everybody else. Everybody else went to him and inquired from him what God said. And did what he said. They were dependent upon him. That is the old covenant. But under the new covenant, what is so much better in the new covenant? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews 8 talks about it. Hebrews chapter 8. And let me read. From verse 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. It's uh, comparing, comparing the old and the new covenant. Uh, actually, I have to read more, but for the lack of time, I'll just read from verse 8. Even earlier, if you read it, you see that it's talking about the old covenant and the new covenant. Uh, how the new covenant is a better covenant and so on. Verse 7, let me read from verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Second covenant would not have been necessary if the first was good enough. The first was not good. That's why the second was necessary, he says. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. It's talking about what God said in the Old Testament concerning how he's going to make a new covenant. And then verse 11 None of them shall teach his neighbor The thing that is so special about the new covenant is this The special feature of the new covenant He says none of them shall teach his neighbor And none his brother Saying know the Lord For all shall know me From the least of them to the greatest of them That is the specialty of the new covenant Everybody shall know me no one needs to teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord. No one needs to come. What does it mean to say, no one shall teach his brother or neighbor saying, know the Lord. Now some people take this and say, we don't need church, we don't need pastor, we don't need teacher, we don't need the Bible preaching and all of these things because no one need to teach anyone. Well, you need to compare scripture with scripture, try to understand everything. Here it says, no one need to teach anyone saying, know the Lord. But in Ephesians 4 verse 11, it talks about the risen Christ and the gifts he gave to the risen Christ. It says that when he ascended, he gave gifts unto men. He made some prophets, some, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers. So when he went up, the risen Christ, when he ascended on high, he simply did not ascend leaving the church, he gave gifts to the church. What are the gifts he gave to the church? The ministry gifts given to the church is the gifts of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. He gave it to the church. 
Why would he give pastors and teachers particularly to the church if there's no teaching needed in the church? If no one needed to teach in the church, why would he give pastors and teachers? So it is wrong to say that Hebrews 8, 11 says that we don't need to teach in the church, we don't need to preach, everybody will simply know the Lord. That is not the meaning of that. When it says no one need to teach his brother saying know the Lord or his neighbor saying know the Lord, it does not mean we can dispense with the teaching in the church, the pastoral ministry or the teaching ministry in the church. You can't do that because Jesus is the one that instituted that gift in the church, gave that gift and placed that gift in the church and, and is behind those people that are preaching and teaching in the church. Then why does it say no one needs to teach anyone saying know the Lord? You need, you need to understand it in the right sense. It means no one needs to say, you all come to me, I only know, God only speaks to me. God only tells me what to do. You all come to me and I will tell you what you need to know. No one can tell a brother or a neighbor saying, God, like the Old Testament prophet, God only speaks to me. You have no business saying that God speaks, spoke to you and you know things. No, 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 you can't know it. You come to me, I only know. And therefore, I will only teach you. If you want to know anything about God, anything that he says, you need to come to me and find out. Otherwise, that is wrong. That is gone with the Old Testament. Now, no one needs to teach another man saying, know the Lord. And uh, no man needs to teach a neighbor saying, know the Lord, because everyone can have a direct contact and relationship and fellowship with the Lord and know the Lord personally in that way. God is in touch personally with everyone. That's the glory of the new covenant. You and I are in personal touch with God. Now that, I'm, uh, I'm sure that makes it worthwhile to call the new covenant a better covenant. Because that's such a wonderful feature that everyone shall know the Lord. What a big difference from the old covenant to the new covenant. Old covenant only some people claimed there is God spoke to them. In the New Testament, not just some people, everybody can claim that God is speaking to them because God speaks to everyone. God is in touch with everyone today. God can get in touch with everyone. God can reveal things to people. Everyone can know the Lord. That is the new covenant. This is a wonderful covenant. Now this means, if everyone can know the Lord, then that means... If in the Old Testament only some people knew the Lord, some people heard from God, only some people can speak on behalf of God, and in the New Testament everyone can hear from God, everyone can know the will of God, if that is true, then I would say to you, in the Old Testament there were only some selected people that were prophets, under the New Covenant every single person is a prophet. I hope it comes out very clear to you. In the, Old, in the New Testament, every single person is a prophet when it comes to that person's own life. I'm not saying you go and prophesy to someone else. I'm saying when it comes to your own life, you are your own prophet because no one needs to tell you, listen, God is telling you to go to Bombay tomorrow. <laughs> God can tell you what you need to do. God can show you what you need to do. God can lead you and God can guide you. Every single one is a prophet. When it comes to your life, you are a prophet because what does a prophet do? The prophet declares what God is going to do. And when the prophet declares, it happens. Talks about Samuel, you know. Next week I'm going to talk about that. You know, it's, there are several references. Next week I'll read them all to you. Several references, very similar, says in effect, Something like this. It was said of Samuel that not one word that he spoke fell to the ground. Have you ever heard that? A man. Samuel is just a man. I'm Samuel. Some of most Samuels are here. He's just like any other Samuel. This Samuel. This good old Samuel. A man just like you and I. You know. You know, my parents named me Samuel because they had some difficulty having a child. Then they ended up having nine children after me. But 
And then finally I was born after some initial struggles. And then they named me Samuel because they asked God for a child and God gave. And that's why they named Samuel. And Samuel is the same story, you know. His, his mother, you know, prayed and asked God and asked of God. That's what it means. And God gave that child. So there are many Samuels here. Maybe they, your parents named you like that because after some initial hiccups you came and, uh, and there were some obstacles, there were some difficulties and, and, and they asked you, uh, they asked for a child and you were born and lo and behold they named you Samuel. But let me tell you this, that Samuel is just like this Samuel. But about that Samuel it says, he spoke and not one word that he spoke fell to the ground. Not one word. What does it mean to say not one word fell to the ground? That means not one word failed in fulfillment. Everything he spoke came to pass. Everything he spoke came to pass. So what is a prophet? A prophet is used by God, taken by God, and God gives him his word so that he speaks the word, so that whatever he speaks comes to pass. That's what a prophet is. So when God wants to do something in the nation of Israel, as prophet speaks it and declares it, and after he's spoken, there comes the fulfillment. Sometimes it comes in a few days, few hours. Sometimes it comes in few months, few years. Sometimes in hundreds of years it comes. When Jesus, getting ready for the birth of Jesus Christ, 800 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. To fulfill that this happened, it says, Matthew's gospel says, 800 years later, the fulfillment happened. 500 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Micah said, in the little town of Bethlehem, Jesus will be born. 500 years before. So the fulfillment will come surely. Sometimes it comes in five hours. <laughs> Five days, five months, or five hundred years also it may come, but the fulfillment comes. God speaks, and whatever he spoke through Samuel, not one word fell to the ground. Now, you and I have become prophets. In the very same sense that under the Old Testament some of these fellows were anointed, especially as prophets. Why I say you and I are prophets under the new covenant? The reason is because you and I can know our destinies from God's word. God can speak to us, reveal to us through his word our destinies and what he wants to do in our life, what God's will is for us. We are people who speak under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, our destinies. And whatever we speak comes to pass. And I say, if whatever Samuel speaks, spoke, everything came to pass so that not one word fell to the ground. You and I and other Samuels and other Joes and Jims and Jameses, everybody can speak in such a way that everything that we speak comes to pass in our life also. In that way, you and I can be a prophet. You can live... It is possible to you that you can live in such a way that you can take the word of God and authoritatively declare that it shall be so and it will be so. Not one word falls to the ground. What you said will come to pass. In fact, you have to say it and that's the only way God can do anything in your life. You have to declare it. So every day you have a responsibility, a prophetic responsibility. You have the responsibility to stand up in the midst of your home, in the midst of your business, in the midst of the work of your hands and whatever you are involved in, whatever endeavor you have undertaken to do. You have the responsibility to stand up there as a prophet and declare what God will do in that situation, in that realm, in that aspect of your life. You must declare. God wants you to declare. Even God of heaven cannot do anything without you declaring. God wants you to say what will happen. Say what he says. Then only he can do what he wants to do. He cannot do it without you saying it. That's what I'm trying to say. 
God just does not do it. His method is still the same. He, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. There, God said that there be firmament. There was firm. God said and it was so. God said and it was so. God has not changed. He's still a God who says and it is so. But now he uses man because he's made man. And man is on this earth as his representative. And man is over everything. He is crowned with glory and honor. This is the glory and honor that is given to man today. Don't you... Don't you think this is the greatest glory and honor given to man that he can speak and what he speaks will come to pass God could have said you just stay as a dummy <laughs> Some very powerful people keep some dummies, you know So God could have said you dummy You you take the seat here on earth, but whatever I say only will come to pass. I will retain all my power that means you get no respect. That means he doesn't think very much of you. He doesn't want to honor you. He just uses you as, your, as a dummy to do whatever he wants to do on this earth. God doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to put you in charge. Whatever you say will come to pass. There is a risk there. There is a risk there. Because when you say whatever you say is going to come to pass, you may be saying all kinds of nonsense, you know, and bring things to pass. There is a risk there. But God would rather take the risk so that the honor and glory will be yours than to take away your glory and honor and leave you with nothing. God honors humanity with such glory and honor. He says, whatever you say will come to pass. That's the glory and honor of man. That is why I say you should never get up every morning and say I'm nothing but dust and a worm and no good rotten thing, you know. No, that is not the way God looks at us. You should get up every morning and begin to see what God wants to do in your life. You're feeling weak and worn. You feel without strength and you feel like your strength is failing you and health is failing you. God wants you to stand up in the midst of it and say, Jesus is my healer. His word is medicine to all my flesh. Therefore, I declare health and healing and well-being to my body. In the name of Jesus, sickness shall not come nigh my dwelling. There is place for health in my home. No place for sickness. In Jesus' name, I speak well-being. You have the authority to say that. You can get up in the morning and be faced with all kinds of needs and problems financially and so on. But you need to open your mouth and begin to declare as the king in that situation, as the priest of your house, as the prophet in your house. Don't be going and standing in line somewhere to hear some prophecy. Just imagine these people going and standing in line for somebody to prophesy. They have the Holy Spirit inside. They are dragging him along with them. Going to another prophet, who's going to ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to say to them? That is the biggest insult. God can speak to you. You are the prophet of your life, particularly, particularly when it comes to your life. You are the prophet of your life, particularly when it comes to your life. No man has the authority to say this is what is going to happen in your... It's not because what they say it will happen. It is because what you say and what you say will happen. Not just not what anyone else says. You have the authority to speak into your life. Life and peace and joy and happiness and victory. You, have the, you are the authoritative person to speak these things into your life. So, you are the prophet of your own life. Everybody say, I'm a prophet. <laughs> One fellow said to me, what gift do you have? Can you prophesy? I said, I'm prophesying every day. <laughs> what are you talking about? Every day, I'm whatever I prophesied has come to pass. Every day, what, whatever I'm involved in, whatever I prophesied has come to pass. I came into this place when there was nothing here and I prophesied one day there will be people here from corner to corner filling this place and it has happened already. 
and I am now prophesying we will build a grand place, beautiful place, a wonderful place. I prophesy, I speak every day, that place will be built in Jesus' name. It will be built, no matter how much it costs, no matter how great a task it is, it will be done in Jesus' name. I'll say, one day you will see it fulfilled. It will never fall to the ground because that's the way God works through man. Impossible things become possible. God wants you to speak it. Speaking it is involved in faith. There is no faith without speaking it. You cannot exercise faith without speaking You cannot say I live by faith and be talking all nonsense, you know. Speaking is a very important part of faith life. You believe, then you must speak. If you believe, you must speak healing. You, if you believe, you must speak health. If you believe, you must speak victory. If you believe, you must speak success. If you believe, you must speak what God says about your situation. You must speak it only then it can happen. You must speak it. Now, I remember so many people said so much ab about how it will not happen here. I, you know, actually some people even talked to me, good friends of mine, talked to me, said, you're all right, you preach and all that, but it just won't work here. They told me as a very good friendly advice. <laughs> it just won't go well here because India is different and your thing is just, you know, this all this Bible preaching and all, this won't go. You got to have some extraordinary something, you know, to cause things to happen here. You know, otherwise nothing will happen here. They thought, what is this guy going to do just preaching the Bible? Nothing is going to happen there. They all told and nothing what they said happened. And some of them are prophets. Hello? <laughs> I decided long time ago that I am the prophet over my life, over my family, over my church, over everything that God has given my responsibility. I am the prophet. I must speak life into it. I must speak success into it. I must speak a beautiful destiny and future for it. I must declare what it will be in every way. I must declare and what I declare only will happen, not what someone else declares. I remember back in those days, somebody, somebody will bring some people saying, brother, he's a great prophet. Whatever he says will happen because it has happened. Whatever he prophesied for me here, I brought him to you, let him prophesy. Whatever he said never happened to me. Whatever I said only happened to me. You must remember that what you say only will happen to you. Don't worry about what everybody else says about you. If everybody else says you will fail, don't be worried about that. If you speak success, that's what you will have. It's the basic fundamental law of faith. That what you confess, that's what you will possess. What you confess is what you will have. That's the basic law of faith. Now, you need to then operate in that, you know. Some people think, if that man says, it'll happen. If this man says, that'll happen, you know. One fellow went to one of our church people's house, it seems, and asked them, it seems, does your pastor come to your house? See, I have come. Will he come to your house? <laughs> and he went to the right kind of person. Because this fellow said, why should he come to my house? What will he do if he comes to my house? He's not going to do anything special when he comes to my house. I go to the church. I hear the word of God that he preaches. I come to know the truth. I bring those promises. I bring those words that he preaches there and declares. And, and I get a revelation of that. I come home and I declare over my life and my family, over my business, everything, those words. And those words become a reality. Why should he come? But your pastor never set foot in your house. They, they believe in the pastor's feet more than the word of God, you know. I've actually had some people tell me, you just put your feet in there, just one minute. Put your feet in there. 
you just touch a little bit. <laughs> I remember back so many years ago, I went somewhere and uh, dedicating a house, you know. This is like 25 years ago. And, and uh, I went and prayed and, and spoke a little bit about uh, uh, the whole blessing of God and so on and read a passage of scripture and then prayed and the house dedication was over, I thought, you know. But then the man said, well, pastor, thank you, but let's continue now. And he said, come to the bedroom and pray. <laughs> so I went to the bedroom and I prayed. And then he said, we got two more, three more bedrooms. Pray for the, the other bedrooms also. So I went to every bedroom and prayed. <laughs> then he said, let's pray in the dining hall. I said, pray, I prayed in the dining hall. Then he said, pray, what about the kitchen? I prayed in the kitchen and after that he said, let's go into the backyard and pray. Then already I prayed in the front as I opened the house, you know. <laughs> so I prayed about eight prayers in and around the house. Eight times I prayed, you know. Except the bathrooms, I prayed for everything. <laughs> now, don't, now don't start including the bathrooms also next time. <laughs> Except the bath, literally, except the bathroom, I prayed for every nook and corner of the house, you know. After praying eight times, he thinks, now I appreciate in one way our Indian people because they are, they are very religious, very, very uh, God-fearing and they believe that, uh, you know, every room must be paid, prayed for. That aspect, uh, that's all right with me, you know. Uh, I don't take it lightly. They, I appreciate that in one way, <laughs> in that, that they are so... God minded and and they want the blessings of God in that way but after praying eight times if this fellow is going to talk whatever he wants to talk then my eight prayers will be one by one cancelled <laughs> it's not what I prayed that is going to work see people detach everything you know they say that's prayer this is fasting this is this that no no no, no. it's all connected what do you pray? When you pray, you take, I, whenever I pray, I pray the word of God. I declare the word of God. Whenever I go to a house dedication, I usually pray, you know, from Deuteronomy 28. And I usually pray Psalm 112 saying, Wealth and riches shall be in the house of the righteous, your word says. So I declare wealth and riches for the house. And I declare peace for that house. I declare God's protection for the house. That's the way I pray. I'm pre praying what the word of God says. And after I go, if this fellow is going to talk about poverty, some people are like that. You pray and you leave and then they say, all I want is half stomach full kanji. <laughs> if God gives me that, I will be happy. Then even half stomach full kanji will not come. <laughs> because what you, what you say is what you're going to have. It's not what I prayed. You're not going to have what I prayed. You're going to have what you say. Confession brings possession. It's so real, my friend. Because no matter how many preachers come and pray, no matter how many great men, gifted men of God come and pray, unless you possess the promises of God by faith, it's never going to happen. That's the thing that people have to understand. You need to possess the promises of God by faith and faith requires that you confess what God has said about your problems, your struggles, your difficulties, your challenges and your needs. Confession brings possession. That is so real. So you're a prophet because you can speak and declare your destiny concerning everything yourself. You have the authority to speak. In fact, you must and no one else shall. You will declare. You must declare. Not someone else. You must declare what shall happen. You must declare every day what will happen. So, that is why it says, no, no one needs to teach another man, neighbor or brother saying, know the Lord. Because everyone shall know the Lord. Now Moses, in the Old Testament, you see Moses was handling 30 lakhs people. Now that's like having a church with 30 lakhs members, you know. And uh, you don't want to have a church like Moses had. That was a dangerous church. 
the believers were unbelievers you know <laughs> they are not the kind that will march toward the promised land they are a rebellious kind they won't listen they won't believe you know and any time they get a chance if they don't like the pastor they take stones to throw at him you know they are ready to kill him and get rid of him or or get rid of him <laughs> dismiss him from the job you know and he was pastoring them delicate situation there <laughs> and uh, the 30 lakhs people means you'll have a lot of problems with especially if they're unbelieving kind and you know not very obedient and not very not very god fearing so they had all kinds of problems and cases of uh, uh, cases of uh, uh, all kinds of disputes between them are to be solved and only moses was god authorized man there one man trying to solve 30 lakhs people's problem i'm sure they had a token system and everything you know and a waiting list and every 30 lakhs people and this one man had to deal with all of these things you know at one point he got so sick and tired of this he said oh i wish that everyone was a prophet did you know that he said oh i wish that every single one of you were prophets that will solve his problem he said i believe it was spirit inspired utterance when he said i wish every one of you would be prophets because exactly what he dreamed and wanted and wished on that day has become a reality through the new covenant so that everyone by virtue of the new covenant has become a prophet his father in law he had a good father in law some people have good father in laws not everybody is like joseph you know i mean jacob jacob had a bad one <laughs> but this guy had a good father-in-law. His father-in-law came to his rescue one time. He said, look, 30 lakhs people is too, too much for you to handle. So appoint 70 elders and uh, let them handle the problem. And whatever they are not able to handle, then you handle that. Now you divide 30 lakhs people by 70, it's still a lot of people. It's still out of control. <laughs> you cannot really bring into control everything. But... Uh, it brought some kind of solution, some kind of a little relief maybe, but the real solution is to make everyone a prophet so that everyone does not have to depend on Moses, that everyone will know the Lord, everyone can go to the Lord, everyone can pray to the Lord, everyone can ask the Lord, everyone can know what God wants for their lives. Amen? Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Now it's talking about the anointing that every believer in the New Testament under the new covenant receives. This is not what we call a baptism in the Holy Spirit. That is different, you know. Here this verse is not talking about that particular uh, thing. This is talking about a particular kind of anointing that is available for every single believer under the new covenant. All right? So, the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. He's telling the New Testament believers, you have received an anointing and that anointing abides in you. Why is he saying anointing that abides? Because under the old covenant, the anointing did not abide. The anointing would come and uh, then they will speak on behalf of God. The Holy Spirit will descend on them and the prophets will prophesy. Then the Holy Spirit will lift up and leave them. And without the Holy Spirit, they are nothing. They are just, you know, powerless. Then the Holy Spirit will descend upon them. And the anointing will come upon them. This is the, this is the way it was under the old covenant. But in the new covenant, it is an anointing that abides. That the anointing that remains in us. Holy Spirit is not a visitor under the new covenant. The Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us. He dwells in us. He dwells in our hearts. He is there constantly to guide us and lead us. So the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, he says. And you do not need that anyone teach you. Again, the same kind of expression is used as in Hebrews. You need not need, you, you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. In other words, that anointing that abides in you teaches you all things. Notice that all things. There is nothing that he cannot teach. He's the best teacher, the greatest teacher. He can show you everything. 
and whatever he teaches is not a lie it is true and abide in what he teaches stay with what he teaches so the new covenant is a very special covenant and the greatest feature in the new covenant is that under the old covenant only some special people anointed and they were prophets under the new covenant everyone has an anointing and everyone becomes a prophet right everyone particularly when it comes to their life they are a prophet of their own life the holy spirit is able to lead them and guide them and teach them and so on even when you come to church and hear the teaching of god's word see when you come to church and hearing teaching you know you do that because god has ordained the church to operate in this way church is a place of teaching god has put there pastors and teachers a very important ministry to teach the people the things of god all right you come and listen but even then even when you come to church and listen no preacher can stand up there and say everything i say 100% will be right so you better do what i say nobody has the authority to say that because every one of you can listen to what a preacher says and look at your bible and you should a lot of people don't look at the bible you know they just believe the preacher believe god <laughs> they just believe the preacher you need to look at the bible and the berians they not only looked at the bible in church they noted everything down and went home and opened the bible and checked it all over again because the preacher might have slipped in some things that are not right there so they checked to see whether this was so and the bible commends them they are praised for doing so they were not told are you checking me out now you know you don't believe in me you are checking me out you have doubts about what i no people have every right to go and check it out to find out whether it is right or not whether it is according to the scriptures or not and they have every right to decide whether it's right or not because there is an anointing that abides in them that remains in them that teaches them all things they can know what is right and what is wrong so that new testament believer can never say i did this because that man said it that kind of situation should never arise in a new testament christian believers life i've heard so many christians in the new testament times in the 20th 20th century i have heard so many believers say because he told me that it's god's will for me brother that's why i married this girl or this boy you know and then ended up in trouble brother how can that be he told me that it's god's will then how can that be wrong it is wrong because you just went by what he told you that is wrong because god did not leave you in the position today that you have to depend on somebody to tell you and all you have is what you told what he told you how many think it's a great blessing that you don't have to depend on somebody like that that you can know for yourself this is right and this is what god wants for me now in the new testament are there prophets yes there are prophets because the bible says so there are apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers so the prophets are there but the role of the prophets is different now why because under the old testament god only spoke to somebody who was a prophet in the entire nation there was often times one person only was a prophet nobody had the authority to challenge the prophet if the prophet said thus said the lord they better go with it but under the new covenant there are prophets but they don't have the same kind of authority that the old testament prophets had they cannot say i have said you do it no you have the authority to check it because the same holy spirit that dwells in him dwells in you also you can check him out that is why in 1 corinthians chapter 14 when talking about discipline in the church in uh, when it comes to somebody prophesying the apostle paul says when one prophesies let others judge he didn't say let one prophesy and others listen and obey no he says when one prophesies let others discern judge to see whether this is right or not you have every right if you don't judge only it is not right 
If you don't discern only, it's not right. If you don't look into it and say, well, wait a minute, what is this man saying? Is it correct? Is it according to the scriptures? Is it in line with the scriptures? It is, does it line up with everything that the scripture teaches? If you do not judge, if you're going to just take him at his word and go with what he says, I'll tell you, he could be right and hope he's right. And if he's wrong, then everything goes wrong in your life. Hello, are you there or have you gone home? When I first started teaching it, it was very revolutionary here, you know. Some people wanted to stone me for what I said. Even some preachers thought I was against uh, some, of the, some of the ministries and so on. No, I'm not against, you know. I'm just telling you New Testament status. What is the status of a believer under the new covenant? That's all. One fellow said to me, one preacher said to me, you reduce all the preachers to nothing, basically you are saying everybody is a prophet, if everybody is a prophet, then what's the value of this great gift that I have and you know, who will come to me and all of that. I said, brother, at that time I didn't have so many people coming to me, you know. And they thought that only if you were special, somebody lifted, specially gifted like that and nobody else can know the Lord and only you knew the Lord, so everybody came, they thought. So they said, if, if we followed your teaching, nobody will come. But how does, how does so many people come today? What have they come to hear? What have they come to listen to? I'm not saying I will speak and you listen. And uh, whatever I say, you better believe it and you better do it. You have no way of knowing it. No, no, no. I'm saying that I'm going to preach from the word of God. But you have the Holy Spirit inside of you also. You have an anointing that abideth in you. And you have every right to look into the scriptures and see whether what I'm saying is right or wrong. And you can follow what is right and you can keep in the back burner what you have some questions about. <laughs> And immediately begin to follow what you are convinced that you are right, right? And other things you can be convinced later on, right? That's what I do. I read something or I learn something and I come across something that I, I just find it very difficult to digest, you know. Say, my God, you know, I can't, can't agree with that. And I don't touch it. I don't bring it into preaching. There's no time to preach what I know, you know. Why would I want to deal with what I don't know, you know. So I put it in the back burner, you know. Put it away there, there, you know. Let it be there. I'll deal with it after I get through this, you know. Or I'll deal with it while I'm getting through this, you know. I'll deal with it little by little and get to know it. The New Testament gives a very... Uh, 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 gives a higher status to every single believer. It is not like the Old Testament. All right? Okay. <coughs> now, let me just begin to talk about... How do we function as a prophet in our own life? How do we operate as a prophet in our own life? Let me just open up one scripture to you, but I'll continue next week. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12. Jeremiah 1, 12. How do you function practically as a prophet in your own life? 1, 12. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. Now some translations have it like this, I am watching over my word to perform it. There are other translations that say, he hastens to perform his word. That is, he is, he is very, um, he is not delaying it in any way. That he wants to very badly perform what his word says. He wants to bring to pass what he says. He hastens to perform. So God is not delaying as some people think. God is not delaying everything. God is ready. This translation says God is ready to perform his word. He has not only given the promise. He is ready to do what the promise says. He hastens. That means he wants to... Hurriedly perform his word, quickly perform his word. He is not wanting to delay it. He watches over his word. He is mindful of his word that he has declared that it must come to pass. He doesn't want to postpone it, you know, the fulfillment of it. He wants to do it. 
but a lot of times people say why then why is it not happening he has spoken it should he not perform it should he not immediately do it how long can i wait why is it not happening the thing is many times the delay is there not because he is delaying it many times the delay is there because on our side there is something missing the connection proper connection is not made i gave an illustration long many years ago i used to use an illustration here we fly in airplanes today just like it's nothing you know nobody even thinks about it any time when you get on the airplane do you think my god it may fall down you know because the law of gravity is supposed to be working how can you be flying well they have found out there is another law called the law of gift law of lift that can lift a plane with 400 people and tons of weight and fly in spite of the law of gravity in operation because the law of lift operated by that engine in that airplane and by its wings and the shaping and and the functioning of the wing it is able to fly so we put our trust in that engine and the way the engine the technology works you know and we get on the plane we don't even think about it you know you just go to sleep and you just they take off and fly and we sleep the whole trip sometimes you know and wake up when they land we don't have any questions about it even though you know this is something uh, even though the law of gravity is at work now the law that causes the airplane to fly has been in effect not since the right brothers it has been in effect since adam so adam could have bought a plane and flown around he could have even play made a rocket and flown to other planets <laughs> he could have done all these things because the law that makes it to work was already in operation it's a physical law nothing new about that law that law has already been in operation like the law of gravity the law of lift also could have been discovered and it could have been functional back then because it's a physical law then why somebody did not use it because nobody knew about it nobody knew that the law of lift can be used in this way and it can function in this way it took so many years centuries and centuries and centuries to discover that and then after that to come up with all these uh, advanced devices and technologies to make it worthwhile uh, for us to use it in so many ways as a passenger plane and all of that it took a long time by the time things developed thank god we have it today makes life so easy i wish they had found it a long time ago and i'd find i wish I'd, they'll find out something even better faster and everything the trains the cars everything is like that i came in a car this morning and i was thinking my grandfather's days he was an officer in the government he went by a bullock cart thank god i didn't have to come by a bullock cart this morning <laughs> not with the suit down prosawaka my road <laughs> in a bullock cart everybody saying there goes sam chaladurai you know <laughs> i'm so blessed that i can get in a car unruffled i came here and here i'm in a nice air conditioned place and preaching in such great comfort and thank god for my grandfather would have never thought that this would happen you know but we don't think anything about a car now you know it's just an ordinary thing everybody's got such nice cars now we don't even think about that you know we want better and better more comfortable ones you know because we're thinking about our mind thinks like that now we can go from one nice car to another nicer car you know it's easier to accommodate it but you know before the cars came into being how difficult it is to com- accommodate the idea of a car in 1896 this is history i'm talking about 1986 1896 or 98 in america in the department where they have the patent registration done when you discover something you have to register it in the patent registration department in that department there was a guy in charge he made a recommendation to the government this is history i'm talking about he made a recommendation to the government of the good old us of a and said I recommend that this department of patent registration be closed down it's a waste of time sitting here it may be closed down because everything that needed to be discovered has already been discovered in america 
the guy said everything that could be discovered has already been discovered therefore it's a waste of time sitting in this department you can shut it down thank god he is not my prophet <laughs> my god man you know i i am glad that they didn't listen to him and they kept the department open and more discoveries have been made and things have developed so much since that that time how many things have been invented since that time just imagine how much easier our life has become today because of all these inventions and findings and so on and the application of all these findings amazing amazing what it has done for the world and uh, you know i hope i stay young to enjoy more of it <laughs> every day more things are coming now you buy a cell phone or whatever it is you know by the time you finish reading that uh, all the instructions and start operating it new one comes they say this is old i try to read up on all of these things because i don't want to be left behind you know this is like the second coming you know you don't want to be left you don't want to be left behind in technology so i try to keep up with it i'm very serious about it you know i want to know how it works so i get the latest computer the, the everything all the features in it and i try very hard to work it and everything and by the time i get working it they say no now there's a better one that has come so i have to start all over again <laughs> i bet you there are no, there's nobody saying there in the patent registration department now please shut it down because everything that could be discovered has already been there. that is not the belief today there's a lot of whoever that guy was that recommended that his descendants are in the church today <laughs> turned out as pastors and believers they are members of the church today they believe that this is it and no more they believe that this is impossible that is impossible that can't be true this can't be right and and so on that's the way they go about it that is why it has taken taken us such a long time to arrive at this this point at least so slow if you talk about the blessing of god the prosperity everybody has a question what are you talking about you know because nobody talked about it in the last 200 years it cannot be right you know or something like that the fact is only last 100 years they've been preaching poverty <laughs> before that they were only preaching prosperity in any town you went into in the western countries like england and america any town you went into the most educated person there was the pastor hey yale and harvard and all these universities were opened up by preachers can you believe that pastors one fellow one pastor gave up his books and that's what became the yale university he had so many books thousands of books at his disposal when he died he bequeathed his books to a trust and that developed into a yale university those guys were the most now everybody thinks if, you, if you're a pastor you don't need to do or know anything you know you can just this is something that everybody can do this is something that you know is such a light thing some of the best places of learning were started by pastors and preachers that's the way world was back at that time you know nobody in the whole town had that many books the preacher had <laughs> it need takes a lot of money to buy books you know <laughs> if that guy had thousands of books where did he get the money and today we have developed and advanced to the stage where we preach poverty so strongly so that when i came and started out here i brought a set of tapes by a great teacher who teaches faith and i translated into tamil you know a series called how to turn your faith loose you know and i translated into tamil in america and uh, it came out really nice as radio messages and uh, we were trying to give it as a gift uh to pastors here or thousand sets of those tapes were given as gifts why we gave it as gift was most of them did not have the money to buy it did you know that if you sold it nobody will buy it most of them didn't have money anything the pastors will ask they'll say can you give it free 
I'm a pastor, can you give it free? We have degenerated to that level. <laughs> We've come down to that level so that everything you give them, you have to give it free. And when I gave it free, you won't believe, I'm sad to say this, I went to beach one day to attend a Christian meeting and there were bookstores and I was looking at the bookstores and some of the gifts I had given was on, on sale there. <laughs> These guys had turned around and sold it there. <laughs> sold it there. Amazing. Why? <laughs> because we cannot envision what the Bible teaches concerning these things. That is the reason. See, because we cannot digest it, we cannot grasp it, we cannot come to terms with what the Bible is saying. When, it, when you read about the new covenant and our status and our authority and our power and our privilege that confession brings possession, it only raises questions. Very few people are ready to go for it. Why? Because they think, how can man be such, I mean, how can man be regarded uh, in a, such a high way by God. But the Bible says God has crowned him with glory and honor and put all things under his feet so that man is the one today in earth, in his life, if something has to happen, he has to declare it. Unless he declares it, nothing will happen. That's why the delay. The fulfillment of the promises of God is awaiting your declaration. God is waiting for you to speak it so it can happen in your life. That is the reason for the delay. We'll continue next week. Let's stand up together. Let's lift up our hands and give thanks to God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come. We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful word, for speaking to our hearts today. We thank you. For the new covenant is so much better. It has raised us up to a new level. Brought us back to the way that we needed to be as men and women made in the image and likeness of God. Having authority over everything. And being able to declare what our future is. Being able to speak so that it will be so. We thank you for the great high honor that you have given us. The esteem that you have given to mankind. Thank you for the cross of Calvary that has brought us up to this level, the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And this redemption that has brought us from down there in the dumps to such a high position where we are once again crowned with glory and honor. The honor of declaring and bringing things to pass is ours. We celebrate it today and we rejoice over it. And... Uh, I pray that the eyes of understanding will be opened so that people can understand and know the things of God very clearly and surely. And may they establish peace and joy and happiness and victory over their lives and refuse permission for other things in their lives. May they live enjoying that authority and exercising that authority and power through the words that are spoken through their mouth. We pray your blessing upon each and every one. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each and every one of us for now and forevermore.